And now let's all welcome Chief Impact Officer at Planet. It's Andrew Zolli. How are you all doing? I have. Thank you, uh, uh, Reba Jaffa, for that fantastic presentation. And if someone doesn't bring me a clicker, I'm going to give these remarks as interpretive dance. And it cannot be unseen, much as you wish it might be able to. Hey, um, it's my great pleasure to be here with all of you today. The last time. I was at the AI for Good Summit, I think it was like 2019, it was just before COVID and we went into the kind of crazy lockdowns and it was a fraction of the size that it's become. And what an amazing moment and an important moment for global AI governance. You know, it's a real challenge to have almost any conversation about AI because every position is taken. You know, policymakers worry about its governance, economists worry about its effects on economic and labor dislocation. People are, are enthusiastic, engineers are, are uh, entrepreneurs are enthusiastic about its opportunities for wealth creation. Uh, engineers will tell you how difficult and, and how much more complex under the headlines it tends to be. And in an environment like that, uh, one of the challenges is almost anything you say about AI right now is probably true to some degree, right? It will create enormous amounts of wealth. It will create enormous amounts of inequality. It will be used to tell you the truth. It will be used to lie to you. It will be used as a tool of peace and it will be used as a tool of war, right? Because it will attach inexorably to our intentions and human beings have intentions around all of those things. So I'd like to slightly recenter the conversation. I am going to be talking a little bit about uh, instruments that we put in space in particular, but, but more broadly about how we use AI and these extraordinary powers of, of big data to create new kinds of opportunities for managing planetary transitions. And I do want to tell you right off the bat, the satellites that my organization, Planet, puts it up in orbit, all are designed, they're literally designed to burn up in low Earth orbit. They're literally, we, we actually work very closely with MIT on space sustainability and creating protocols to limit and declutter uh, the global space environment. So I was saying a moment ago, you know, we, we're living in this age of sort of schizophrenia about AI, but that schizophrenia is really part of, I think, a larger schizophrenia. Because if we center on the conversation, that the place that we're on right now, we're in a place where it sort of looks like this. I'm gonna see if I can, did it switch over? Hold on. Uh, I feel dance coming on. There you go. Yeah, this is what we're living through right now. We're living through a period of time in which the challenges that confront us are literally bigger than everyone in this room's ability to conceive of them. I, not just climate, but the intersecting forces of climate, conflict, the global loss of nature, the ecocide that we are uh, currently experiencing. If I tell you that the institutions represented in this room have collectively said that a million species are at risk of extinction by the middle of the century, you can't imagine a million species. It's literally bigger than your brain. It's bigger than all of our brains. We live in an era where the problems are big and getting further from us. You know, we're not making the effective progress on the SDGs that all of us would have hoped that at this point, with seven growing seasons between now and 2030, where we would be. And so if you are a pessimist and if you are paying attention to the data, there's a lot of good reasons for why that pessimism is warranted. But at the same time, while we are living through the sixth extinction, we are also living through the second renaissance, a period of transformational expansion, radical expansion in human capacity, human capability. And if you happen to be, live at the intersection of those two issues, which this community collectively does, you have a moral, not just an economic or some kind of political, you have an ethical obligation to align those tools in the most ethically centered way possible 
to those challenges. It's our job collectively to ensure that the tools that are on the right are aligned to the problem on the left. So how are we going to do that as a practical exercise? I don't have a grand theory because things are changing so quickly that there's been three important announcements made today in just the time that we've been here that none of us have had a chance to absorb yet. So I want to give you sort of like a patterning, a, a, a perspective on what's emerging. Well, the central challenge that we're going to have to undertake, maybe, maybe, ah, oh, there we go, is this, okay? We're going to have to use a lot of, can someone bring me a new clicker? Uh, all right, thanks you. We're going to have to use a lot of information to leverage the non-material aspects of information, right, the non-tangible aspects of information to improve the YMCA, the <laughs> the, to reduce the social and ecological intensivity of human behaviors in every domain. And we have to do it really fast if we want to meet the goals of the 2030 Agenda. We have countless systems to engineer and re-engineer in this context. Just think about agriculture, right? So just take the, the central thing we have to do. We have to feed not only all of humanity, but a billion new entrants to the human story. And we have to do it in a way in which we dramatically improve the efficiency of agriculture while limiting its agri the, the impact of, those, uh, of, those, of that behavior on things like deforestation. So we're going to have to grow more with less and reduce the ecological intensity of agriculture. In order to do that, what we have to do is we have to figure out how to use less fertilizer, how to apply it more judiciously, how to... Um, how to transport less of it to the field, how to ensure that less of it runs off the field and into the rivers and streams, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a combination challenge of taking data and, and, and the insights and indicators that it represents and aligning it to these challenges. Now, my organization, Planet, sorry, I'm not even sure where to point the clicker. So, Okay, so my organization, Planet, we actually are deploying this one of the largest constellations of satellites on Earth. But I want to say one thing really importantly. Again, these are satellites. They're about the size of a loaf of bread. We've put hundreds of them on orbit. They orbit from the pole to the pole, and as the Earth turns perpendicularly underneath them, they collectively line scan the planet every day. So we, we are collecting at sort of a three to five meter resolution all of the world's terrestrial land masses and near oceans. This is 35 terabytes of data a day. It's more information than all the human beings on Earth could possibly look at. It is impossible to get the value to guide the behavior in the field that I just showed you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Hooray, that's the real hero of the story in this presentation, okay? So we, all, we also have a bunch of other satellites to zoom in, but I don't really want to talk to you about satellites. Instead, what I want to tell you is that we're producing vast amounts of information about the Earth. The problem is no longer the data desert. Increasingly, we are living with a data deluge. And the question is, how do we extract meaningfully the information, the value from that information to guide human behaviors in ways that are consistent with the global objectives of meeting the, the great uh, inclusive and just transition that all of us anticipate. Okay, this one works as well as the last one. So, <laughs> okay, I, I, oh, there we are. Okay, so this is not one organization's job. It is not one country's job. It is not one discipline's job. It's actually a huge collective engineering, distributed engineering project. The first thing is with the presence of all that data, we have to begin to classify the world. We have to extract from all that very high resolution information. Where's all the water and the carbon? Where's all the assets? Because we want to be able to track them, to understand them, to guide the behavior that surrounds them. We have to understand where all the agriculture is, where all the assets and the infrastructure and the humans. Where is all the stuff of the world? And today, even though we show lots of shiny pictures, mostly we don't know. So we have to get all that information out at a level of resolution in time and space so that we can actually be able to guide and build systems accordingly. And then, in parallel, we have to integrate it into the extraordinary new power of these new models, which I think when you take 
a classified world, you can begin to ask questions of it in plain language. And we have to make sure that those languages are not just English. We have to make sure that they include the taxonomies, they include the ontologies of all of the world societies to make the information not just accessible, but legible and meaningful. That is an enormous undertaking in its own right. But I want to give you some waypoints, things we're seeing on the, on the way. I'm just going to keep pointing in the same direction and I hope it works. But can, actually, can I just ask you up in the booth? I'll just say next slide from now on. So really what we're doing today is we're taking all of this sensor data that's in the ground, on the earth, in the sky, in space, we're extracting it and making it analysis ready, then we're creating what we call planetary variables. Those are those explicit maps of where all the water and carbon and agriculture are, so that we can extract insights that ultimately help us meet the policy objectives that are up at the top. Next slide, please. Here's a really good example of the power of these capabilities that are proffered by crisis. In the recent uh, ongoing conflict in Ukraine, we worked very closely with a team called NASA Harvest. They're NASA's in-house global food security system. And with them, we've been monitoring every single agricultural field in Ukraine on a weekly basis, which is only capable from space to be able to understand the precise impacts of the conflict on the global food system. As all of you know, Ukraine is one of the world's major bread baskets, and there was enormous concern. You know, an entity, a UN entity like WFP gets close to 40, 50 percent of the calories it delivers in a crisis from Ukraine. If the war shut down global food production, we would see rippling effects all over the world. And it's only with the ability to do this. So this is, this is a big part of building what we think of as geo-AI. This is the foundational stuff. It's actually not, it's not AI in the traditional sense. It's extracting the information and moving up that chart. But we're seeing lots of other places. Next slide, please. Um, where we're being able to do the same thing. Here's a satellite image of a particular piece of forest. Uh, next, please. We combine that satellite imagery with some other remote sensing data to extract information from the uh, satellite imagery about how tall all the trees are and from the canopy height. Next slide, please. We can actually extract exactly how much carbon is in the forest. And then we can monitor that forest for deforestation and understand exactly how much carbon has been lost when every tree is felled. And we're going to be able to do that. We actually now offer this for the whole planet. Next slide, please. Now, it's not just us. There are lots of organizations doing this. This is one of my favorites. It's a group called Climate Trace. They're backed by the, the former Vice President of the U.S., Al Gore. It's a coalition of technical organizations, and what they do is they monitor through the satellite imagery the activity of every coal-fired power plant on Earth, and they use the same tools that Google does to tell you whether or not an image is of a cat or a dog, to tell you if the plant is operating, and then they estimate how much carbon is coming out of it. Next slide, please. So, and if you could, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to just give you one tiny little example. Here we're going to zoom into one part of India, look at one coal-fired power plant. And if you see that little black squiggly line, that's how much carbon has been coming out of that plant. And that information is not reported by most governments around the world. So when we go to COP28 and COP29 and COP30 and on and on and on, we can bring much better information to the negotiations about what's happening. An era of radical climate transparency is being born. Next slide. Now, we'll actually show you the other side of that story. This is about SDG 7. This is a joint collaborative effort between our organization, the AI for Good team at Microsoft, and the Nature Conservancy, a big NGO, in which we are collectively monitoring, identifying and monitoring every utility-grade renewable energy resource on Earth on a time axis, quarterly, going back to 2018 and forward to 2030. This is something called Global Renewables Watch, and it will formally launch uh, with all of that data uh, at uh, COP28 later this year. All of this data made publicly available to track our global progress against SDG 7. Because as I think uh, we just heard, you can't manage what you can't measure or what you don't measure. So we're beginning to see this measurement revolution unfold. So here we are in India, in the same place you saw that power plant. Next slide, please. Here we're going to zoom in. All the blue dots are um, windmills. All the orange uh, squiggly bits are uh, renewable energy resources. There are solar uh, installations. What we see here is not just the generation capacity for all of these uh, utilities, but also what land use was there before we put the renewable energy resources in. 
And that's really important to understand what it's displacing. So next slide, please. And you can see we get all the way down. Now there's a few other really amazing things that are also coming that are gonna bring radical transparency to our ability to guide the planet collectively. And I mean collectively. This is not one entity, one job, one region of the world's job, et cetera. So forthcoming, this is a joint uh, uh, venture between ourselves and, and uh, uh, NASA's JPL and a group of other uh, actors. Next slide, please a group of satellites <coughs> that are what are called hyperspectral satellites. So your and my eyes that we see in a relatively narrow part of the spectra of light. But the actual spectrum is much wider. These instruments are designed to see not just in three bands, but in 400 bands. And their first canonical use case, next slide please, They're, these are being jointly developed between us and NASA JPL, is to do the point source detection of, of methane emissions in the atmosphere. And when you overlay the optical information on top of the invisible methane plumes, you can see exactly who's responsible. The state of California in the United States is a big partner with us in this, and they're excited because if we can make detecting methane leaks dirt cheap, they can make them incredibly expensive to ignore. But this same instrument has other potential as well. And one of the most important is that when you look down and see the whole spectra of light, it turns out that plants and animals reflect light differently. Two trees that might look completely the same to you and I, but two green trees as seen at a distance, actually fluoresce slightly differently. And we can capture that light to understand biodiversity with the same level of specificity that we understand climate. Next slide, please. And you can actually see that here. This is actually taken from flying this instrument in an airplane over a portion of, of Peru. What you see there is just a, what looks like a green mass of forest is actually covered with all of these different species that which you can now identify. And when you can identify it, you can quantify it, you can start to put a value on it, and you can take things that were externalities to the global system and to begin to bring them in and put values on them. You can make them available to frontline indigenous guardians of these ecosystems and people who, who, who are uh, responsible for the, some of the places where biodiversity isn't being lost because it's being protected. Next slide, please. Now, what does this have to do with AI? Well, again, on the classifying the world piece, we're gonna start to bridge to the other side. We're starting to be really good at change detection. The ability to actually have the system tell the humans when something has changed. So now we've trained a bunch of algorithms that let us say, this is an act of deforestation. This deforestation is actually occurring in this place. We're monitoring every day. It was forest yesterday, it's not forest today. And if you overlay the administrative boundaries on top of that, you can see what's legal and illegal. So you can go to the next slide, please. We work very closely with the environmental police in uh, Brazil. Next slide, thank you. And here you're seeing a live system that the environmental police used to take all of those alerts that were now AI-generated alerts on that stack of imagery to tell them where deforestation is occurring exactly week on week, okay? And rather than take you through a technical demo in the interest of time, next slide, please. Let me just tell you that these actors, next slide, there you go, have deployed nearly 4,000 agents in 120 operations. They've destroyed more than 1,000 machines doing illegal deforestation in the forest and collected more than $2 billion US equivalent on the way to starting to arrest deforestation. This is in, not now. This year, the world's deforestation continued and accelerated, and some of the worst of it was in Brazil. So I'm not here to tell you that this is a panacea. What I am telling you is this is what the beginnings of geospatial AI to drive real action, not just reflection, but action in the world. This is what it looks like. And this ability to begin to classify things, to build classifiers for looking for things like deforestation, is about to get radically easier. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a partner organization called Synthetic, and what they're doing here is they're taking all of the satellite imagery, and in this particular instance, they're looking for boats. Particularly, they might be looking for illegal fishing along the coastline. So they zoom in, and what they do is they draw a couple of boxes. They say, okay, like that little chip, that little square thing, that's a boat, that's a boat. Let's click a couple of those. The system goes out and finds everything that's self-similar to those boats. Now, some of those things are not boats. So a human then goes through and says, 
okay, in this space, so what it's doing is it's, it's finding at this real time, it's finding all of the things that looks like they might contain boats. The human will go, that's not a boat, it's a pier. That's not a boat, it's a something else. And train a classifier in a matter of minutes in, able in order to find all the boats that are in this particular area of interest. And if you want to monitor illegal fishing, the ability to do that in real time is really extraordinary. We had a situation in our country recently where there was a balloon of interest. I don't know if any of you have ever heard this. We had, a, we had a balloon incident, okay? And these folks were able to find, next slide, that balloon. This is actually the balloon flying through over the American countryside and out over the ocean. They were able to track the entirety of the balloon, the said mysterious balloon. So again, these are the building blocks by which we start to get the world classified and findable in real time as sensed from space in a way that can drive behavior, not just to report on the SDGs, but to actually deliver against them. And the last thing I wanna show you is what happens when you take that kind of information and you plug it into the chat GPT, large language, multimodal, large language systems. This is what's coming next. Next slide. We built a little demo with our colleagues at, at Microsoft. This is what we call Queryable California. What you'll see up on the right-hand side there is me asking questions in plain English. Like, what was the average temperature in Sacramento, California? The system knows where Sacramento, California is, is able to pull up its boundaries, take that satellite imagery, do a comparative analysis, and give me an answer in plain English in a matter of seconds. Now, why is that important? This is the, really the most important thing I want you to understand. For all of my career, satellite imagery and data analysis has been sort of like library science. You know, if you think about an organization like Google, what made Google Google? Well, the first thing they did was they came up with an incredibly clever way of indexing the internet. And if that's all they did, then what would happen is you would go to the librarian at your local library and ask them to access the Google because you'd have to have a PhD in Google studies in order to use it. But that's not what they did next. What they did next is they put it behind the world's easiest to use user interface, the search bar. So you could just do the sort of 500 monkeys getting to Shakespeare approach. Eventually, if I just typing in queries, eventually I'm gonna get closer to what I want. The third thing they did was they put an economic machine in between the search bar and the index and they made bajillions of dollars, so that was good for them. But here's the thing I want you to understand. The moment that geospatial data and Earth data is undergoing is the moment when we shift from the library science age to the Google age. It's the era where we will get answers about the Earth without necessarily having to look at pixels. Like, you might want to look at these pictures, but you might not have to in order to get a trusted answer. And that is incredibly important because it will take this whole exercise from being the provenance of hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions. And that is how we get a participation revolution that helps us meet the long-term agenda. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you.